Very interesting. Um, the perspective. I sat next to Mike there, and I looked out the window and saw the beautiful scene, uh, Kimberly in the foreground. I don't want to exclude her from the beauty <laughs> and the beautiful bush in the background. And then across the street, the sign for the lottery that said, play here. <laughs> and I thought, we need to come back to this side of the street and say, pray here, pray here. Let's do that and begin. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to pray. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you in song and in our heart, Lord, and in our voices, Father. The opportunity that we have to fellowship here and bless one another and greet one another and, and encourage one another and exhort one another. And the opportunity that we have to preach here and herald forth your word, Father, uh, to a lost and needy world and a saved and needy world, Father, I pray that you would bless, Lord, your word as it goes forth today with power. And we pray for our preacher this morning that you would bless him and encourage him and let him have great freedom in the spirit and great power, Lord, of your Holy Spirit, taking your holy word and help making our hearts holy, we pray. We pray that all hearts would be open to what you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jeremy, you come and uh, he has asked me about the cold on one side. You know, the Bible says it's lukewarm, you know, and kind of in the middle it's good. And then um, he's asked me about the time. And I, I said, when, you know, when the people start leaving or it starts getting dark or something happens, I don't know. But uh, you come and preach what's on your heart. God bless you, brother. Okay, I love you. Well, this is definitely interesting. Uh, preaching in an open doorway, it's a... Uh quick getaway if things start getting ugly and you start throwing things at me you know <laughs> I can get out quick thank you for that special selection I love that song how it starts out the body of Christ isn't just the church it starts out with the head doesn't it and what he's done for us the head of our body is Christ and then and then it goes to the body the how we wait for our bridegroom with the light in his uh, light, his light in our eyes, and um, and we wait for that second coming. In the meantime, what do we do? How beautiful are the feet that bring the sound of the good news and the love of the King? And so I, it fits right in with what we're going to be talking about today in Ephesians chapter four. Uh, what is our job? What is our calling? So if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 in your Bibles. I'm going to start reading uh, verses 1 through 16. We'll read that whole paragraph there. Not going to be preaching on that whole thing because that's about 10 sermons or maybe even 12 but uh, it does give us a lot of the context for what, you, for what we'll be talking about. So Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body one spirit, as just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, his grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended onto, into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers 
for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by white, what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edification of itself in love. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, I just thank you again for this opportunity. And Lord, I know coming here, I've already had a couple of uh, connections with Pastor Becker and his family and with Sarah and her family and uh, Lord, we do know, though, that our connection is more tight in the body of Christ. So in that way, I'm connected to every man, woman, and child here as, as their brother. And Lord, I just do pray that as your word goes forth, that we may be a unified church, the church of Christ working together, unified, edifying one another, growing together in love and teaching your gospel to our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, those whom we work with. Lord, I pray that we may be a, an active church that loves you and seeks to expand your kingdom. For we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. So I don't know you. You don't know me, but we know God. Amen. Amen. One Lord, one God, one Spirit. And we have that same Spirit of what we just read here. But preparing a sermon for people I don't personally know uh, does get a little tricky. Uh, you don't know me and, and my background and some of the struggles that I fought through, because we all have struggles, right? Nobody's perfect. Uh, so... I always like to try to prepare something that the Lord's teaching me, because that's the most effective way to teach, is through personal example, right? And th this is what a testimony is. When you're witnessing, a lot of people think, limit witnessing to, I'm going to share the gospel. But witnessing, you're telling eyewitness account of what God has done for you. So it's not just saying, you're a sinner, you need to get saved, here's the gospel, here's the good news. You're witnessing to each other as you edify each other, right? You're building each other up. When one is down, if someone is going through the same struggle or has gone through the same struggle, you can counsel, you can help that person through their trials. You know, God never promises protection from trials, right? We still have trials. We still have uh, the effects of sin in this world get us down. But he promises to help us through those trials and the biggest gift he has given to us is each other the body of Christ and so uh, I, I come before you with things that I've learned to teach you but I also like to try to match what I'm going to say with what I think I believe what I've prayed about the people need to hear and I just know that this church has gone through some trials and your pastor is traveling from a foreign country every day to get here. <laughs> every Sunday to get here. So, uh, you know, there's you're not without trials, but you do have other men here that can lead and other, other uh, families uh, that, that can help keep things going. Uh, but I did want to talk about the body of Christ. So... In the absence of one or two of this body, this body can still continue, correct? Am I right on that? So um, I felt it appropriate to uh, speak on this topic. Plus, Pastor said to avoid Second Peter because that's where he is. So <laughs> figured the Bible's big enough for the both of us so we can <laughs> find somewhere else other than Second Peter. 
But first, I want to talk about our calling. We need to be loyal to our calling. Paul says here, I beseech you, I plead with you, I beg you, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. What were you called to do? Were you called to be a pastor here? <laughs> One of you was, right? Not everyone. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, not all are apostles, not all are prophets, not all are teachers, not all are workers of miracles, not all speak in tongues, not all interpret, you know, different gifts that he gave. Now we believe the sign gifts ceased, but uh, he gave different gifts for us to minister to each other. Because right following 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 13, he says, If I have all these wonderful, miraculous gifts, but have not, what? Love, I become as sounding brass, clanking, I'm just making noise. You know, the, the, the folks in Corinth that wanted to just all speak in tongues because that was the cool gift to have. He's like, what good is speaking of tongues if nobody understands what you say? How can you minister and edify to someone if you're just vain babbling? You know, so our gifts that he has given us are to edify, to strengthen, to build up the body of Christ. And so not all of us are pastors, not all of us are teachers, not all of us have the gift of evangelism, yet he calls us all to evangelize, right? Not all of us have maybe the gift of giving or the gift of help, but we do need to give and we do need to help. Um, but where our strength lies, and, and I know I'm not preaching in Second, First Corinthians 12 here, this is the passage, but obviously the Bible comments on the Bible. And in First Corinthians 12, it says, you know, if, if everyone was the nose or, or the feet, where would be the smelling? Or everyone, knew, you know, that I can't remember exactly how it says, I guess I could turn there. But if everyone did one thing, who would do the other thing is basically what it's saying. And so we all have different gifts, different abilities that we need to strengthen within ourselves in order to help the body grow. So what is your calling? And um, that's what I want us to think about this first part is we need to be loyal to our calling. If you want to turn real quick back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, Paul writing to the Corinthians, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Jesus Christ is both their Lord and our Lord, he's saying, but... You are called to be saints. And this tells us who are the people that are called to be saints. Those who have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you've called on his name and you've taken his name upon yourself, you are a saint. You are set apart for the work of Christ. And so this is the calling that you have. You are a saint. Not one that is prayed to, as the Catholic Church teaches. You know. uh, but you are a saint. The word saint means set apart. Set apart for the Lord's work. So he said, I beseech you. I plead with you. Walk according, walk worthy of your calling. And so when we think about that, how do we walk worthy? I mean, there's two things. That I have a couple of don'ts. And then this passage gives a bunch of do's. First of all, don't deny Christ. You know, Christ says, if you deny me, then I will deny you. And how do we deny Christ? We're not sitting there saying, you know, I don't believe you. <laughs> We're not, you know, how can Christians deny Christ? The biggest way is to not walk worthy of your calling, right? Right? If you're a Christian and you're walking over to the lottery thing and wasting your money and you're playing over there instead of praying here, is that worthy of your calling? You know, if you're a Christian and you're 
struggling with addictions and you're not seeking help, you know, yes, there are Christians that struggle with addictions and we need as a body to be forgiving, especially if they confess their sins, correct? You know, we, when they confess their sins, I tell my kids all the time, where there's confession, there's forgiveness. And if Christ forgave us, we need to forgive and we need to help, right? And so if someone stumbles, what does a proverb say? A righteous man stumbles seven times and gets back up, right? We stumble, we sin, we confess, we get back up. The body is there to pick us back up when we stumble, but if our lives are characteristic of someone that sins that grace may abound, you know, Paul says, don't sin. Shall we sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. You know, there are people that think, oh, I'm forgiven. I'm saved. Woohoo. Now I can do what I want. It's that free ticket out of hell. If I'm say these magic words and say this prayer, that's my free ticket out of hell. And so... They might be trusting then, not in Christ and the shed blood, but they're trusting in these magic words that they said. So, but if you are a Christian and you are living like the world and you have not set yourself apart from yourself, you have not died to self, you have um, become an imitator of the world instead of an imitator of Christ, you are denying Christ with your actions. And that brings us to the second don't, is don't take the name of Christ in vain. And in the Hebrews, uh, great Ten Commandments, take not the Lord's name in vain, for the Lord will not hold you guiltless who takes his name in vain. We're not talking about the using God's name as a curse word, strictly speaking. It's talking about you've taken the name of Christ to yourself. Much like a... a bride when she marries her husband takes his name right and if that bride after she takes the name of her husband goes and does worldly things she's bringing shame to the name of her husband and his family obviously the husband does that too <laughs> but the illustration is we are taking we are the bride of christ we are taking his name and so if we put his name on ourselves and call ourselves Christians and we live like the world, we've taken that name upon ourselves in vain. He says, don't do that. So walk worthy of your calling. How? Verse 2, with lowliness. Humility we're talking about. Christ was lowly, sitting on a donkey, the king of kings riding on a lowly donkey right? Born in squalor, born in poverty, just swaddling clothes to wrap them up. No nice, cute, soft little baby blankets with a little squeaky bunny, you know, in a stable. Came in humility, the almighty maker of heaven and earth who created with just his words, humbled himself. And we can't humble ourselves just a little bit to say, I'm sorry to someone that might have offended us or we, to someone we've offended. You know, that's something I'm struggling with when I'm teaching my kids because we all know how kids are. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> Go on, shake hands. You know? <laughs> Humble yourself. Why do you do it? Doesn't matter. He was hurt. Just say I'm sorry. Right? How much would strained relationships be fixed or be saved if we just say I'm sorry? If someone comes to us and says, you know, you did, you said, you know, I, I was probably wasn't the wisest thing to say, I'm, I'm sorry. Lowliness. With gentleness. So this is kind of like the flip side of that same coin. So let's say you are the one that's offended. What do you think you're doing? 
you have no right to talk to me that way. You know, that's not right. You know, you could come all gruff and pointing your finger down, looking down their, your nose at them. And no, we come in gentleness, right? The scriptures say that if you're, um, if you have a brother that sinned against you, go to that brother, talk to him first. If he listens, you have gained your brother. And we talk, the, the scriptures talk about rebuking one another in love, right? And so we are lowly, we are humble, but we are also gentle. So if we are the ones being rebuked, be humble. And be like, I'm sorry. You know, thank you for pointing that out to me. You know, or maybe maybe someone thinks you did something wrong and you actually didn't. You can gently explain your motives, your actions, or whatever. And instead of just being like, well, who are you to judge? You know, you do such and such and such. You know, no, we we receive rebuke with humility. If we have to give, we give rebuke. In love, in gentleness, bearing uh, uh, with long suffering, right? Christ is long suffering. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to you know come to repentance. You know, talk about being the example of long suffering. You know, some six thousand years after creating the world, the world's still ticking, right? He's he's tarrying. He's waiting for us to repent. Uh, Nineveh, 40 days and you shall be overthrown, gave them a long time. Abraham prayed over Sodom and Gomorrah, and God waited to cast judgment on them. How many times did he give Israel a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a twentieth, a sixty-seventh chance? He gives us those same number of chances when we fall. He's long-suffering. Should we not be like Christ? Be long-suffering with one another. Bearing with one another. That means tolerating, putting up with each other. We, we all are quirky, have our own little quirk sometimes, you know. Oh, that person's a little strange, or people might think we're a little strange or different, or, you know. No, we put up with one another because they are part of the beautiful body of Christ. And so we bear with one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Too many churches split over things as simple as the color of the carpet. You know, they, we think it should be that. No, we think, or the type of music. I've known people that would walk in here, see that drum set, turn around and walk out. You know, it's like, that doesn't say anything about you and how much you love the Lord or how much you, you, you know. That's like, that's casting a judgment without even knowing the people. That's not keeping the unity in the bond of peace, is it? We have the same Father, the same Savior. We have the same Spirit. And sometimes we let our own personal spirit get in the way and cause division and split. Now, obviously, if Pastor Becker gets up here and starts deciding to teach that this word is not fully the word of God, you know, then it's time to ask him to leave, right? The Apostle Paul, who had direct revelation from God, said, if I or any other angel of heaven speak another Jesus, let him be accursed. We are men. We can say the wrong thing. And this is why Paul praised the Bereans for searching the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. It's your job to hold your pastors accountable, not to follow them blindly. Paul says, follow me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What does that mean? If I stop imitating Christ, you better stop imitating me. Right? And so... We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There are times to separate or to put people out of the church if they are teaching heresy, if they are teaching wrong. But if they're just worried about, 
uh, that, that, well, we meet at 9.30. I think you should meet at 10.30. You know, <laughs> I'm going somewhere that's meeting at 10.30. You know, this place is, or, you know, well, you're not spiritual enough because, you know, we, we want to worship God first thing in the morning and we're worshiping an hour earlier than you. <laughs> you know, it, you know, people do get hung up on this stuff. And this is what we need to guard against. And so we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's a reason why Christ said, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Now, this is a message of division, isn't it? Christ said it's a stumbling block to the Jews. It divides families. People who hold true to the Word of God, who have family members that are like, whatever, it does divide families. So he says, as much as lies within you, you share the good news and you try to live peaceably with all men. How much more should we live peaceably with each other who are of the same spirit? Right? And so walk worthy of your calling. You are called a Christian. You are called to be set apart. We are a peculiar people. Right? The scripture said. And so that's who we need to be. We need to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And so when people might mock you for meeting uh, or for holding to an old-fashioned fairy tales, you know, you know, we need not worry about that. We are to be different. We are to be the salt of the earth. We are to be the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is our calling. So it does not matter if you're not a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary. You are called where you are to show Christ, to show his light, to teach his truth, to be the feet of the gospel wherever you may be. So let us walk worthy of that calling. Skipping down to verse 11, I want us to start thinking about we need to labor in the ministry. We just talked about working. Labor in the ministry. And the first point there is to submit to training. He himself, Jesus Christ himself, has given, uh, gave some to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for equipping the saints. Remember, you're called to be saints for the equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That word uh, equipping, katerizo, means to bring to a condition of fitness, according to Strong's. And so... You're going to the gym when you come to church, when you're going to Sunday school class, when you're meeting together for prayer and Bible study midweek, uh, when you're reading your own Bible and your personal devotions, when you're meeting with your friends and your neighbors and having personal Bible studies or discussions or helping build each other up. This is all part of our training. We are going to the gym. We are getting fit. We are getting in shape, right? So he says these people... The apostles and the prophets, to which we don't have anymore, they laid the foundation according to First uh, no, Ephesians chapter 2, just a couple chapters back, verses 19 and 20. It says, um, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and, fellow, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so that foundation was laid by that, the apostles and prophets. So Paul, 2,000 years ago, was a gift to us, right? 4,000 years ago, Moses is still a gift that keeps on giving, right? Right? We have the word of God from Revelation to, to from Genesis to Revelation. These were the apostles and the prophets, the, the apostles and prophets, 
And they were the ones that Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, used to build this foundation for the church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We are in enemy, t enemy territory, and the enemy has yet to tear down and remove the body of Christ. Amen? We are still here 2,000 years after Christ's death and still going and will still continue to go until Christ seems, deems it fit. Or actually the Father. He says, I don't even know. The Father is the one who will send me, right? Till he returns and takes us to be with him in glory. The church moves on. Onward, Christian soldiers. Amen? So, they are gifts to us. But who else is a gift to us? Evangelists. Pastor Becker wants to, he has his uh, evangelistic trek, if you will. He's got his evangelistic ministry with a techno sin that he travels around the country evangelizing and preaching the gospel and showing how you can be saved from your sins. One of the things I tell my kids is when you are saved, you're not being saved from hell. Right? Being saved is not fire insurance. You know, it's not. It, you are being saved from your sin. You are given the power to overcome your sin when you submit your life to Christ. So he's out there evangelizing. And then he comes back here and he pastors. And you might have some other men in your church that that help with that pastoring, that shepherding ministry. He does not do it alone. You have deacons in the church that help and assist with that pastoring, right? Um, and so these men are gifts to you that equip you for the work of the ministry. Too many churches are content to sit by and let the pastor and the deacons or the elders do all the work. You know, let, let, you know, I got someone that needs to hear, can you come to my house and witness to this person for me? <laughs> you know, the pastor is ministering to you and teaching you how to minister to others, right? That is equipping you and uh, for the work of the ministry. So we don't just have Crossroads Baptist Church with just Pastor Becker going out and trying to minister to this entire community all by himself, and you're just here giving him money to do your job. You know, that's not how the pastor is to be. You, you can't abdicate your responsibilities by throwing money at the situation, saying, oh, that's what we pay the pastor to do. And there are churches that operate that way. And they wonder why people aren't growing in the Lord. You know, just... Just because you're a small church does not mean you're not growing. Amen? It's, we need to be growing personally. Success of a church is not in the numbers. You know, Joel Osteen would have you believe otherwise, right? The, the, some of the mega church pastors that, that preach the health and wealth gospel, they, they believe they have to be successful and show their success by having thousands of people in their church and... That's not success, is it? There is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. You are precious in the eyes of God. Right? Amen? And we need to see each other just as preciously and treat them, those people as other children of God. And so we have these pastors and our teachers and our evangelists, all speaking on the foundation that was laid by the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. This is the gym that we go to to get physically fit to do the work of the ministry. And so what are you doing with your calling as a saint? Do you have a neighbor and that fence is all that separates you two, and you never look on the other side of that fence. Relationships. The whole... How many of you have ever been involved in the multi-level marketing, some type of multi-level marketing, whether it's Fuller Brush or Amway or, 
or, or Mark in America or Mary Kay or something like that. And what do they say? The most effective way to market is word of mouth. That's how they build their business. And I'm thinking, isn't that how the body of Christ is built? It's word of mouth. It's developing personal relationships with that person across the fence who's always annoying you by using his leaf blower and blowing all the leaves on your property. That doesn't happen to me. I live on a farm and there's not. <laughs> but I do know there are people, you hear story. I mean, I think, um, who was it? The, the senator from Indiana. Was it Indiana? No, Kentucky. Paul, Rand Paul. Rand Paul, the neighbor was blowing the, there was a big scuffle there because his neighbor was blowing his leaves across and wouldn't clean up, the, the tree leaned over and the leaves fell on his property. He was trying, yeah, yeah, big mess, you know. But if that were you, would you get all in a huff or try to sue your neighbor or would you say, hey, let me help you clean up your leaves too? You know, let me, hey, come over for dinner. You know, if you have special events at church or whatever, and if, if you've been regularly witnessing to your neighbors, to your co-workers, to your friends, your family that are unsaved, why not introduce them to your larger family? That's something that we've been trying to do at Emmanuel Church. We've had different events, outreach events, um, that are a service to the public. What? Families can bring their, moms and dads can bring their children to have some fun. We pass out tracks and we do uh, times of witnessing. But the main goal is we want you to get to know. We're going to invite you over for dinner. Come on over for dinner at our house. You know, you just think it's something that you'd like to do with your own personal family. Let's do it with the larger body of Christ. Get to know our family. So the work of the ministry is up to you. Your pastor is your shepherd who guides you. Your deacons that you have here are your shepherds that guide you, that encourage you to keep doing that work of the ministry. So he doesn't have to do it all by himself, right? It is your responsibility, especially when he's in a foreign land called North Jersey. See, North Jersey and South Jersey are two different countries, you know. <laughs> So when he's away, you know, the, there's an adage when the pastor's away, the deacons will play. You know, <laughs> well, we get to do whatever we want. Pastors go, no, no. But when you have your leaders are away for whatever other reason, and you can't, uh, they they can't be here because you know someone's sick, needs to be visited in the hospital. Someone had surgery, and pastor can't make it. Fill the shoes. How hard is it to go and say, I'm praying for you, brother or sister, right? So the work of the ministry is not just evangelism to, to your friends and neighbors. We call that relational evangelism. You are telling the people that you have deeper relationships. It's very hard to stand on the street corner and pass out tracts and actually get someone to listen to you because you're a stranger. Why should they listen to you? But if you've developed bonds with your neighbors and your coworkers, and you've developed a rapport with them and they actually want to know what you believe and, and think, you know, there's more of a success in bringing them to the gospel, letting them, helping them understand the gospel than the street preaching. I'm not saying don't do the street preaching. I'm saying relational evangelism is going to be statistically the, the best way, the fastest way to get people in our doors and hear the gospel. And so you are the ones that are called to be uh, uh, doing the work of the ministry. And it's not just to the lost, it's to each other. If the one pastor has to counsel every single one of us every day, every week, you know, you're going to wear them out, right? Share that load. I think it's, it talks about sharing that in the in the passage that we just read is sharing that load. Um, yeah, 
Verse 16, which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body of Christ for the edifying of itself in love. So that second point there, submit to training, uh, uh, to, to labor in the ministry. So we need to be loyal to our calling. We need to labor in the ministry. That evangelizing, always be ready to give a hope, give a reason for the hope that lies within you. So that means if you are talking to someone, what they call cold turkey, you know, your grocery store checkout person or, or whatever, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. But we also need to be caring for each other's needs. So that leads us to our third point is to love the body. Love the body. Build up. Edify. To reach a common goal. We talked a lot about different ways to love the body already. But what is that common goal that we are trying to reach? Till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, the same Jesus. If any of you preach a different Jesus, if I or an angel from heaven preaches a different Jesus, let him be accursed. No, we are preaching and we are worshiping the same Jesus. So we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of Christ to a perfect or a complete or a mature man, which is um, in contrast to what he says in verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So we are striving to be a perfect man to the measure of, and the stature and the fullness of Christ. We know uh, in Luke, um, Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Jesus teaching his disciples. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained, which actually is the same Greek word, not the exact same Greek word, once past tense, um, that we that we talked about earlier when it says equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Kat, uh, where is it? Where is it? I have it written down if you actually care about it. Katarizmeno is the Luke one. Katarizo is equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So there's, a, there's the idea of getting in shape, and then there's the idea of being in shape. And so Luke uses that word. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly or completely, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly trained, will be like his teacher. Amen. Isn't that our goal to be like our teacher, Christ? And so we need to love the body. We need to um, come to the same, the unity of the faith, the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect or complete, a mature man, as opposed to a child, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. To be like Christ. We sing that hymn, O oh, to be like thee, right? That is our goal, is to be like Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so we need to mirror Christ. And that is how we love the body of Christ. Christ gave himself for the sheep. He gave up his life, his comfort, his eternal glory te temporarily, right? He humbled himself to be a lowly baby in a manger, the creator who spoke the words and the stars and the worlds appeared just with the voice of his mouth. His breath, that same breath it talks about all scripture is given by the, we say inspiration, the breath of God. 
the same breath that said, let there be light. The same breath that said, let there be stars. The same breath wrote these words and breathed into us and quickened us and made us alive in Christ. We have that power of Christ within us. And we're using that. That thing had a lot of power, didn't it? We're using that to build each other up, to minister to one another, to lift each other out of hardships, or to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is the ministry that we are called to do. That is what Christ did for us. He took our feet out of the miry clay and put us on a rock, right? This is who we are to be like. Humble, meek, lowly, gentle, compassionate. So that we can be like him. And we have the power to that. Our nature says, me, me, me. Take care of me, right? We are by nature selfish People who want the luxuries and comforts, if not better than anyone, at least the same as everyone else. Well, he has it. Why can't I have it? And we, but we are to put aside the things of this world, even sacrifice the things. This is why we give to the church. This is why we give to our missionaries to support them because we know their work is so much more important than the big screen TV that we could have to watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> You know, what are you giving up for Christ? What are you sacrificing for Christ? He sacrificed much more for us. So we need to be like our master. And so the conclusion there is so that every part does its share, we need to be unified. If the world sees that we are a split and divided, why would they want to be like us? We see the world, the United States of America is split and divided Republicans, Democrats, Republicans think Democrats are, are scums. Democrats think Republicans are scum. And Washington is broken. And you talk about division in families that doesn't have to be there. That's not important. What is important is their eternal souls. And and I know in my church, we have people in our service that are registered Democrats. We have people in our service that are registered Republicans. We have people in our service that are independents. That's not where God draws the line. You can add that. There is no, neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither Democrat nor Republican, right? In the body of Christ, we are united under Christ. That's what brings us together. And we might have different political positions or views or whatnot, but we need to lay them down at the sacrifice and say, you know what, that's not as important as souls. That's not as important as being unified so that the community says, you know, they're a great family. They love one another. They care for one another. They take care of their orphans and widows. They take care of the person that just lost their job and help them get on their feet to find a new job. They pray for their sick and they bring the meals to those who are struggling. I want to be part of that group. When we are unified and we work together and you put our lights all together, you know, one candle is not as bright as 10 candles, it's 20 candles, right? We put our lights together and we work together as a local body so this community can see your light that you're shining and glorifying God who is in heaven. This is being loyal to your calling. And so that is my challenge, especially in this time where pastor has to drive back and forth. You need to help him do his job which isn't all his job, it's your job. You are to equip yourselves for that work of the ministry and you keep working until we're all unified in Christ, amen? Let us pray. Father, I do thank you so much that 
The body of Christ is more than just a local church here and a local church there. But no matter what church we are in, if we have called upon the name of Christ, we are all brothers and sisters and we are unified. And it's great to be able to come to a church 80 miles away from my home church and meet with brothers and sisters of, the, of like mind. And I pray that this church may continue to be faithful in sharing the gospel with their neighbors with their friends and co-workers and family members who do not know you and just exemplifying what it means to be a Christian so that we can be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. Help us all to walk worthy of that calling for which we are called and bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.